Welcome to Education Forum. I'm Herman Badillo, Vice Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the City University. The improvement of education affects all New Yorkers. This program will focus on the key educational issues and challenges before us all. My guest today is Dr. Victor Alisea, who was born in Ponce, Puerto Rico, and came to New York City at the age of seven, and came to live in East Harlem and Harlem, and then went through the public school system and enrolled in City College in pre-engineering. But then he decided that he really liked to work with people more. And he transferred to Columbia University, where he got a bachelor's degree in experimental psychology, a master's in social work, a master's uh, in philosophy, and a doctorate in urban planning. Then he went to uh, work as a social worker, and he went to uh, work in different city agencies. Uh, for example, he was an assistant uh, deputy commissioner of the Community Development Agency. And then he was uh, involved uh, in urban planning with Columbia University. But in 1973, he decided he wanted to try something new. And he founded uh, the first bilingual, bicultural, uh, private college in the United States known as Boricua College. Um, what made you uh, decide that you wanted to start a college? Well, I think that the idea of starting a college in our community um, was something that was floating around for a long time. As you know, every, every ethnic community that has ever come to the United States at some point creates its own institutions. And uh, in, the, in the 70s, where, when Hispanics were really Puerto Rican, we never used the term uh, Hispanic, we knew that uh, education was not only uh, the main way through to get to the American dream, so to speak, but also that we needed to create our own institutions as a way of solidifying our community and as a way of creating a, a kind of a self, a positive self-image for ourselves. So how did you go about starting And so it, uh, it's a strange way. I think that if I had uh, thought about how to do it, I would never have gotten involved because mm -hmm. of all the complications that, that it took. But, but uh, it was an important mission for us, and uh, in 19, uh, uh, late in 1973, uh, I pulled together a, a team of, uh, of uh, Puerto Rican professionals, among them Augustine Rivera, Maria Morales, um, with the assistance and, and the leadership of Blanca Cedeño and Jose Moscoso and other uh, uh, people in the community who for a long time wanted to, to start a, a college uh, of our own. And uh, we began with a small planning team to try and sort out what, what were the, the best ways to educate our people. Of course, in those days, I mean, as you recall, uh, about 63% of the Puerto Rican students that had entered the, the public uh, college system were dropping out, even though we had open enrollment. So it was kind of a revolving door. At the same time, almost 60% of the Puerto Rican students in high school were not completing high school. So well, unfortunately, the percentage is not much uh, lower today. It's about 60 percent. Yes. I mean, so you could see the, the, uh, the, the kind of uh, stress that that placed on our community, recognizing that that kind of thing was happening. And so we felt that, that we needed to create an alternative um, educational uh, opportunity for our community. And, and why did you feel it should be a <coughs> bilingual, bicultural college? Well, uh, first of all, it was the kind of experience we had. We, know, uh, we knew that, the, that one of the issues that would have to affect our community and, and, and affected our community in school was the issue of the cultural base of, of, the, of the schools as well as the language issues uh, that, we, that our students brought uh, with them. We, we did a study back in 1973 uh, uh, to find out why it was that Puerto Ricans dropped out of school and then why was it that they, those that did stay, stay? And, what did and you of find? course, we found that language was obviously an issue. Um, the, the, the inadequate early education was an issue. Um, of course, economics was always an issue. Uh, um, uh, so we found that culture was a very important issue because we found that there were students who were very good students who still dropped out of school. And they dropped out because they felt alienated from the basic culture an environment of, of, the, of the school system. I remember that you started out in Brooklyn uh, because uh, I thought it was strange that you, anybody would start a college in a storefront. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I've seen churches uh, and storefronts yes. and other um, 
organization was getting started, but that was the first time that a college got started in a storefront. How many students did you have when you started? When we started, we had 26 students, and it was uh, interesting. Where they, as far as I was concerned, they were really part of the planning team because at one point we decided that we could not plan in abstraction that we, we had to plan together with the potential students. So the 26 students that we brought in became really part of the planning team, and they helped us to sort out the, the, the issues about education and, and learning that we needed to struggle with. And it's out of that experience of 26 students, 26 people who were the students and, and us as the faculty members interacting uh, uh, through that process, what we call action planning, we found out how we should educate our people. And so we created a new educational model. How many students do you have now? Today we have 1,200 full-time students, and, over 5,500 graduates. And you have the, uh, what locations do you have? We have a campus in Brooklyn. In it's the no, longer the no longer the storefront. <laughs> no longer the storefront. Okay. Yeah. No longer the storefront. Uh, we have a campus in Brooklyn with about 800 full-time students, and we have a campus in Upper Manhattan on 156 in Broadway with about 400 uh, full-time students. Now, when you started, you only had a, uh, an associate degree. We now only had an associate degree, yes. We what had do you have now? Now we have uh, bachelor's degrees in a variety of areas, elementary education, business, human services, and a broad array of liberal arts. And we also have master's degrees in, in human services and in Latin American and Caribbean studies. Now, the, the college is still uh, bilingual, bicultural in Spanish, is that correct? It's bilingual, bicultural in English. I mean, but I mean but with the Spanish the, language. With the Spanish English language. English and the Spanish and, language. Yes, yeah. yes. And, but let me tell you a little bit, uh, I mean, because the issue of bilingualism is so, is so hot on our yeah, minds. Yeah, I, I want to ask know. you about that. Uh, bilingual education at Boricua, I think, is, 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 is conceived differently than from other places. First of all, to come to Boricua, you have to know English. It's not our intent or our goal to teach anybody English who doesn't know English. So you, you do have to start on a particular level of English when you enter Boricua College. Secondly, bilingual education at Boricua is part of our method of instruction. So therefore, it's embedded in the faculty. It's not something we're requiring students to. We require students to learn English. But we recognize the variety of levels of English that our students bring. And so it's the faculty who is bilingual. I don't think you can be a bilingual institution if your faculty is not fully bilingual. And so my faculty is totally bilingual. But tell me what the th your theory of bilingual education is, because you remember uh, I founded uh, Oster's Community College mm -hmm. in 1968, mm -hmm. and we found in 1997 that they were going to graduate uh, students who could not write an essay in English, mm -hmm. and that many of the classes were monolingual. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in the, we find now in uh, the K through 12 system that we have many classes that are also monolingual. Mm -hmm. Now, my theory of bilingual education when I was in Congress and, and now is that uh, it's two languages, English and another language, right. and that the, they should not be uh, monolingual education, but both languages should be used. That's what right. theory do you use? Well, that's precisely uh, the truth, and I think that uh, I totally concur with, with your concept of bilingual education. That's why it has to be in the faculty member. W we begin with the assumption that uh, to enter Boricua, for example, you have to know English. Again, on a particular level, not as much as you would need to go to Colombia, for example. The faculty uh, can function in both languages. In our institution, we provide individualized instruction. Our courses are very small classes of 10 to 12 students, and the largest class is 25 students. All the classes are in English. That's the basic language. But a student can ask a question in Spanish and have the teacher, the faculty member, respond in Spanish and then translate it back into English for those students who want to ask the question in English. Is, is the goal that when the students graduate, they should be fluent in both languages, Spanish and English? In a sense, that's not the goal, but that's what does happen. Our focus is on intellectual skills. In other words, our, our focus is on developing people's capacity to use their intellect and, and their affect as part of their growth process. So that we focus on the training of the intellect. And when you do that, the languages develop. But the key element and the key instrument in this process is that the faculty member is bilingual and knows how to utilize both languages at very unique 
uh, moments. And of course, because of the small classes of 10 to 12 students in a class, and because we give individualized instruction, one-on-one -on -one with a faculty member, this, this is possible. Well, how are you able to have small classes of 10 to 12? Well, that, that's, that's, the, that's the mystery. It is possible. Well, we have... Well, first of all, how, how is bilingual college uh, funded? That, well, uh, our college, uh, our students uh, have access to all the variety of financial aid uh, what, what's program. the tuition the, per The tuition semester? is $6,000 per year. Uh -huh. Same? Um, yeah, $28.50 uh, per semester. Um, the students have access to all the various financial aid uh, uh, sources from the public uh, s uh, system, um, both federal and state, and they're able to put together a package of financial aid that not only pays for their tuition, but allows from three to four hundred dollars extra uh, of, uh, for books and, and, and so on. And there we do a lot of fundraising. We have to do that in order to accommodate some of our students, particularly the working student, because as you know, the, the student that works is the one that has the worst time it, in getting what, financial aid. Is, what, is the, uh, what is the typical student like? I mean, how old is he? Do they work? Do they have, uh, the, are they married? Do they have mm -hmm. children? What is the profile? Right. The typical student uh, now is about 30 to 31 years old. Uh, primarily female. Uh, our, our population is about 74 percent female. Um, generally all have um, head of households. Um, uh, many work, many of them work and have jobs and that's why we're an evening college. We, be, we begin our classes, our group classes, at 5.30 in the afternoon to 8.30 at night. We provide individualized instructional classes at any time during the day so students are able to take time off from work or come at the lunchtime, or the employers allow them to come, and we're able to provide that course in individualized instruction. But everyone ends up being full-time student. But the the profile is, as I mentioned, primarily about 72 percent female, uh, 31 years old is the average age, uh, working persons, matured, highly motivated to be educated. Oh, you have. Uh Associate degrees, right? We have associate and degrees. What what kind of degrees do you give an associate degree? Yes, our associate degree is a liberal arts degree. Mm -hmm. From the very beginning of our college, we felt that the tra the traditional institutions provided associate degrees that were primarily focused on technical fields. And in the seventies, as you recall, I mean, that was one of the big problems that the, the community colleges, where most of our people went, were so focused on technical skills that when students graduated, there were no jobs there would be a problem. And then we, we decided to, to create a two-year liberal arts degree. In other words, to broaden the framework of people's thinking rather than focusing them, focusing them so quickly on a technical field. So our core curriculum is a liberal arts curriculum, liberal arts based in very much in the traditional uh, way that we think of liberal arts. And do so the students do many of the students go on to get a bachelor's degree from there? Oh, yes, absolutely. We, we, we not only encourage it, we, in, we almost insist on it, except for those students who feel that they have to go back to work for a couple of years. So we get a lot of students, some students who graduate from the two, our two-year degree and then come back a few years later. But essentially, we're a four-year institution. Okay. Um, we'll be back after these announcements. a child you don't have to be perfect you just have to be yourself which by the way is pretty good do good mentor a child call 1877 be a mentor okay now we've set up the mystery you run a private college uh, Boricua College and uh, you charge essentially the same tuition as a city university does and yet you say that you are able to have classes with only 10 and 12 students. How can you do that? Yes. Well, we have, as I said, a variety of classes. We have the, the largest classes. We have our 25 students. Um, we have but classes. But even those are well, small compared to us. Compared. Well, one of the things that happens is that we have a method of instruction which is called facilitation, educational facilitation. It, it allows for a, for a full-time faculty member. Uh, full-time faculty members assign a certain number of students. Now, when you have that kind of very close working relationship between a faculty member who is committed, because this is also our mission 
in our community. Uh, you have a faculty member who works very closely with students. You, in a holistic way, which means that we're not just concerned with what you're learning, we're, we're concerned with what's happening in your life's environment. Uh, when the, you faculty, have that. Uh, the faculty members uh, are tenured for the most part? We don't have a tenure system. We have a long, uh, a long contract system. Um, for example, uh, 50, over 50 percent of our faculty has been with us over 15 years. Mm -hmm. Just to give you an example, so and, what, and and do they get what do they get paid compared to the professors at the city university? They get paid close to what the the professors at the city university system gets. I, we don't have the kinds of uh, other kinds of uh, fringe benefit packages that city university has. I don't think anyone compares favorably actually with with city with the city university system, but we are compatible with the other private colleges. In, in, the, uh, in the metropolitan area and outside the metropolitan area. Um, but what is, uh, as I was saying, what is important is that when you have a very close working relationship between faculty and students, you eliminate uh, all the, the kind of support uh, systems that you end up uh, putting uh, together in other institutions. You don't have to have a counseling department. You don't have to have uh, other kinds of support systems because the faculty members are working closely with the student. This is not unlike small liberal arts colleges all over the country. And you don't have a bureaucracy. You don't have absolutely uh, many vice presidents no, or vice no. chancellors or anything No, like everybody's in, into direct instruction. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, and that's also extremely important. We're, we know, you know there are three parts to every university, instruction, community service, and research. We're not doing much research. We do a lot of direct instruction, and most of our faculty is embedded in that. Minimal research and a lot of community service. Okay, now what is the, um, about how long does it take for the average student to get uh, an associate degree or a four-year degree? Mm -hmm. uh, first, let me tell you that we, we give 38 weeks of instruction a year instead of the traditional 30 weeks. So we, are, we manage to get a student who works at a average pace can graduate in two years for his two-year degree and in four years for his four-year degree it's because we add these two other summer cycles to, to the system and we make it part of the curriculum. As you know, when you go to school at night and you go to college at night, it always takes you longer to make mm -hmm. it. But because of the way we structure uh, our programs, uh, we make it possible for a student to graduate on time. Most of the time it takes them one extra cycle, one extra semester, sometimes it's the summer cycle, which is a short cycle or the long one, to finish. We, we graduate about 300 students a year. So what percentage of your students drop out mm -hmm. and what percentage graduates mm -hmm. over how many years? Mm -hmm. Well, first, our, we have a retention rate that's close to, to 70 percent retention rate. Again, because of this personalized instructional mm -hmm. methodology and because of the high motivation that we have in our students. Um, so it's a very high retention rate compared to, to other uh, educational uh, systems. We, we are now, as I say, graduating about 200 students in our bachelor's program and another 100 in our associate degree program. Um, our cohorts essentially and being about 60% uh, of, of a cohort that starts out in the first year um, is, um, is, is there in the fourth year. Um, so that it takes another cycle uh, for them to complete. And in some instances, students drop out for a semester, handle family problems and so on, and then come back. Needless to say, uh, Herman, our students have suffered the same kinds of issues, the same kinds of problems that uh, many people at City University uh, face, uh, uh, and perhaps because we're smaller. We're a small liberal arts college compared to the huge systems that we have in the City University system. Um, but because we're small, we're able to do certain, numbers, certain things that I don't think can happen in a large bureaucracy. If you had to, uh, if you had uh, 200,000 students that we do, as we do, mm -hmm. do you think you could do the same, have the same results? I think that it's possible to have the same results. It really is embedded in, in whether we can motivate faculty um, to engage the students. Let's face it, we, we have the same, uh, the same minority groups, the same immigrant groups, the same number of immigrants yeah, today yeah. that we had in 1940s mm -hmm. when you came. Mm -hmm. We have the same issues. The only thing is that it's a different kind of minority. We have a language issue 
at work here. We have to find ways, and it can be found, for faculty in, in these institutions to, to, f to figure out how to work with a student whose language is different. Now, you were accredited by the state of New York, Absolutely. Right? We're, we, we have, uh, we're accredited by Middle States Association of Colleges and Universities, which is a regional accrediting body, and by the New York State Board of Regents from where we get our charter to give all our degrees. So we have all the same accreditations of any other private institution. We're one of 180 private institutions in New York State. By the way, we're the only minority institution ever accredited in New York State. There are no other private minority institutions in New York State. Um, so we're accredited just like uh, everyone else. Uh, have you kept track of uh, what happens to your students when, once they graduate? We, we have. Uh, we've been, in fact, it, it's been uh, just recently we were able, to, out of a 5,000 or so graduates, we now have in our hands information on about 3,000 of them. Um, one of the things that we have built into our program is that during the last semester of a student's uh, educational program with us, they are required to be in an internship to provide community service or to do teacher training uh, and so forth. And what happens is that our students get picked up in, in, into these jobs because there's such a need for, for bilingual uh, professionals. And so our students usually find work. Um, it's part of our program to, to introduce them to workplaces so that they are picked up. We've, for example, there's a, there's a public school in, in Brooklyn where there are 12 of our graduates working in that one public school. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they get picked up um, uh, very quickly because there's such a need for, for a trained bilingual person. What plans do you have uh, for expansion of any? Well, um, glad you asked because mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we want to do is, is uh, open up a campus in the Bronx. We feel that the Bronx is a, is a place that, that could use our, our kind of services and our kind of educational approach. Um, it's a borough that has over 50% Hispanic now. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's a place that we want to go to and we want to be able to provide the four-year um, curriculum that we have. Uh, we think that there are a lot of our students who do go through the various community colleges in, in, in uh, in the Bronx, and we think that we can provide a service there. And when do you plan to do that? Well, uh, we are um, looking for spaces now. Um, we, we think we may have an opportunity to be there sometime towards the middle of next year to open a small campus and begin to, to test ourselves in, in the Bronx. Now, why do you think we have such a problem with our students um, getting a high school diploma in the school system? I think that the, the, the problem in the public school system, which is slightly different for, from my perspective than, than what's going on in the colleges, if, if I had my rudders, um, I, I think that the, the, there is a, a lack of understanding or at least acceptance of some of the uh, basic concepts of psychology and, and learning that I think uh, uh, are important to take into account and are not taken in uh, into account in the public school system. For example, if I were in charge of the public school system, uh, I would uh, have a, a, what used to be called the junior high school, the middle school, mm -hmm. and separate the, 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 the male and female students at that point. I think the psychology and the biology of a growing teenager is much too complicated to have them merged at that point. I think we have the early years where we have co-ed. I think there's a point of separation where each of these uh, uh, children can, can learn to grow up and to experience themselves and, 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 have, and get some equilibrium between their psychology and their biology at that time, and then bring them back together in high school. And I think the real problems in the public school system lies in the junior high school. And you can tell, you could see student, children growing up, doing very well, excited about education, and all of a sudden they fall through a hole, so to speak. And then by the time they're trying to get back into high school, just hanging by their fingertips. And then, uh, and then they fall out. And I, I think that there's a great deal of work to be done there. Apart from the fact that I think testing needs to be looked at as the basis for judging anyone. I have to ask my wife about uh, uh, breaking up the uh, kids in the middle schools because she teaches the seventh grade. Mm -hmm. uh, but tell me this, mm -hmm. do you have a problem with the high school graduates from the New York City public school system Absolutely. that come into college 
and then are not ready for college work and need remediation. Mm -hmm. As you know, that's yes. the big problem at the city university. Yes, yes. I think that there, uh, to at first I think that uh, that remediation, if it's going to happen at all, uh, should be a bridge that should take place in the high schools. Yeah, but if it doesn't, like, okay. like now, what, like, what do you do uh, at, uh, for Equal College? Yeah. Well, what we do is first of all, we, we have a testing program, and we, and we do have a, a, a systematic remedial program. I mean, there is a, a tutoring, or tutoring available to those students who are drifting behind. Um, but because of our, our small classes and our individualized instruction, we can do that. But um, how long but, does uh, it take, uh, take you to uh, finish remediation for the average student? It, it really isn't, we don't call it remediation because it's developmental, essentially. We're, we're, we're bringing someone up to a particular level. And, and that is different for different students. I think to homogenize and kind of have everyone as if they're all on the same level of uh, deficiency, if you will call it that, is, is incorrect. And I think that, that you have to individualize that developmental part for students. If you group them and, uh, and attempt to bring all of them to the same le at the same rate and the same level, it's not going to work. Remediation has to be individualized. That initial stage of acculturation has to be individualized because and you don't know whether it's a language issue, whether it's a cognitive issue, you don't know whether it's mathematics that they don't know, you don't know whether it's English. You have to individualize. And you find that you're able to dispose of that uh, problem Absolutely. fairly quickly. Absolutely, because we individualize the student. And I think that that's, it's expensive to individualize. But that's the only way we're going to save uh, some of these students that we're losing because... Well, I, I wish we could do it as well at the uh, City University, but. Well, Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with you again. You can reach us by email at our website, www.cunytv.cuny.edu, to let us know what you think, or write to us at CUNY TV, 25 West 43rd Street, Suite 1220, New York, New York, 10036.